So let's start. Our next speaker is Tomasz Erlich. Uh, and Tomasz uh, is a full stack developer and is also involved in the Python community in Czech Republic. And I believe Tomasz organized two first editions of PyCon Czech. And uh, he will talk about the GraphQL uh, is the new black. So give a warm welcome to Tomasz. All right, uh, welcome. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yep. Oh, awesome, awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, so welcome, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to be here. It's actually my first talk in uh, Czechoslovakia in 30 years. Can you believe that? Uh, <laughs> right, I would like to introduce you uh, to this uh, relatively new technology called uh, GraphQL. Uh, this technology uh, originally developed uh, by Facebook in 2012 and open source in uh, 2015 is uh, more common in a uh, JavaScript community. So uh, before we continue, let me just uh, do a quick survey. Uh, please raise your hand if you know at least Barry what GraphQL is. Nice. Now, how many of you actually use GraphQL? Nice. And finally, how many of you prefer it over REST? <laughs> okay, this, this looks like a good audience. <laughs> so the first thing uh, you need to know is that uh, the GraphQL is a query language uh, for APIs. It's an uh, alternative uh, to REST and can completely replace it. Uh, to understand advantages uh, of GraphQL, uh, first we need to learn about all parties involved. So, as you know, uh, I in API stands uh, for the interface, and it's the interface between the server and client. And I guess this audience is uh, more familiar with server than a client, because uh, to be honest, that's where the interesting part is. And on the other hand, uh, it's a bit, uh, the client is a bit uncharted area where nobody knows what's this. So, uh, during this talk, I'm going to try to focus more on client requirements because uh, it's much harder to understand someone else's problem than our own, right? So if I wanted to explain you what's GraphQL in uh, 30 seconds or less, I would use the example from a GraphQL homepage. Uh, the server describes the API in a schema. Client uh, can ask for what they want using this query language and the server returns data in exactly the same, uh, exactly the same shape as uh, it was asked. Uh, this is actually one of the most important attributes. The shape of the response we get from the server is defined by a client, not uh, by, by a server. Now, let's take a step aside and talk about uh, REST for a while. Uh, REST is a simple and beautiful architecture for APIs, usually implemented using uh, basic HTTP calls. Uh, we can use get request to query the data uh, on the server and post, put, patch, delete to modify them. Uh, SC in REST actually stands uh, for a state. So we could also say that uh, the read only operations, uh, we are querying the state, and with uh, write operations, we are mutating the state on the server. And it's really as simple as sending an HTTP request to an endpoint and we get the data. The important thing is that we always get the same shape of data, which is defined by the server. It uh, doesn't matter if we need only a subset data or if we need some extra data, we always get the same response, right? Now, no matter how good our API is, we very often find ourselves in uh, two situations. First, when we need only a subset of data returned from a server. Uh, this problem is called overfetching, and REST has some workarounds uh, how to optimize responses, but nothing is standardized. Uh, for example, we can pass uh, extra URL parameters like uh, include, to include and uh, exclude uh, fields uh, which we are interested in. But it really doesn't work uh, on scale when you uh, are trying to filter relations and so on. Uh, for example, if you ever work with uh, GitHub API, you know it gives you quite a lot of data. And usually, you only need uh, just a few of those. Uh, 
Uh, overfetching affects mostly the server because we either need to carefully optimize uh, our API to return only most common data, or we need to include like everything that the client might need, and then uh, uh, we just have a performance uh, cost uh, to actually load this data. Uh, so, for example, if we have, uh, if the server uh, has some expensive data, we either include them in an extra endpoint or we return them conditionally. On the other hand, if we need some extra data, which aren't available in the single response, we need to send several requests. Uh, this problem is called underfetching, and it affects mainly the client, which becomes slower due to extra network request. Uh, if we can send a, a request in parallel, it might be fine, but sometimes we need to uh, query the first endpoint, and based on the result, we need to query the second endpoint, and just the client is becoming slower and slower. So GraphQL solves both uh, over and underfetching by allowing a client to request only the data it actually needs, including the relations. Uh, it reduces the number of requests to a server and uh, reduces the amount of data transferred to the client. Uh, this is very important on mobile and uh, slow connections. Uh, server, on the other hand, can load time-consuming or CPU-expensive data only if the client requires them. It's no longer to optimize endpoints when the API is designed. Uh, the server has the information what data the client needs and can optimize the query at runtime. Now, it might feel a bit dangerous to give the client the power to query arbitrary data from the server, but it's not the case. The server is still in charge of setting the boundaries and client can request only the data which the server allows them to. In other words, REST API uh, defines a response and uh, we need to consume it all. On the other hand, GraphQL uh, defines what we can actually query and then we can pick what we need. Now, this is the main difference uh, between GraphQL and REST. And now, let's take a look at uh, practical examples of uh, how GraphQL queries actually uh, looks like. So, let's start with queries, which are uh, read-only operations. They are the same as a GET request in REST. Using query language, we can list uh, all fields uh, we would like to retrieve uh, from the server. And that's actually all we get. Some fields represent concrete data types, like number and strings. Uh, these data, type are, data types are called scalars, and you can imagine them as uh, leaves of a graph. Uh, in this example, uh, it's the ID of object hero and the name. Uh, this is how uh, such a, a query is implemented in Python. It's very similar to REST. Just instead of serializers, we have, we, have, uh, we have a types. And instead of views, we have the queries. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's actually very similar. Uh, in GraphQL, however, we can also query the relations. Uh, when you have a field, which uh, is an object or an array, uh, you can query fields on this object as well. Uh, you can think of such nodes as, a, uh, as such fields as a nodes of a graph. Uh, that's how this que uh, query language actually got its name. We are requesting a graph of data from the server, and we get exactly the same graph, just filled uh, with the actual data. Uh, as you can see in this example, the syntax for querying object and array is the same. Here, the hero is an object, uh, and uh, friends is an array of objects. The type of returned value isn't defined by a query, but rather by the schema which both server and clients has access to. Uh, what's interesting, that we can also pass argument to each field. Uh, arguments are used to anything from pagination, filtering, but uh, they can be also used uh, to specify, for example, size of images, whatever. Uh, here we pass an argument to human query, uh, which is like uh, if we call get request to get a detail of an object. Uh, below, we are passing an argument to photo field to get uh, the image in a requested size. All these arguments are uh, named. They can't be uh, positional, 
So let's uh, make the API more flexible if in future we are adding uh, more arguments. Uh, we can also define arguments for the root query and uh, make the query more general. Uh, when we do that, we need to explicitly state uh, what data type this variable has, and then we can use the variable anywhere in the, in the query, which means that we can write just one query and then just uh, pass variables in it, and it will fetch uh, different data uh, from the server. Now, uh, I prepared, I just want to show you a short demo. So the first demo is exit this presentation and enter mirroring, right. So I can see what I'm typing. So this uh, is the official uh, API of GitHub. Uh, the fourth version of a uh, GitHub API uses GraphQL. And this interface here, uh, you can get uh, with most uh, GraphQL uh, servers. Uh, what's now is about this interface. Uh, on the left, uh, you are writing a query. On the right, you see the response. And you have also uh, uh, like implied documentation because uh, this documentation can be extracted uh, from the schema. Uh, so here, let's say, oh, this is the first example. So here, uh, I'm querying the licenses on the server. And what I'm interested in is uh, just the key, name, and some permissions this uh, uh, license gives you. Uh, right. That's a good question. Yes. Technology. You can do it more. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is how the query looks like. Uh, in the root, you start uh, listing uh, fields uh, which you are interested in. Uh, for example, here, licenses, and I'm interested in uh, license key, name, and uh, some permissions. Uh, when I run it, uh, this is the response I get. Uh, so you can see it's, uh, I get an array of licenses and all data I need. Uh, since the, uh, here, I'm a client. And since the client has uh, access to schema, I can just uh, take a look what data are available to me, or I can just browse the documentation. But uh, they both work fine. Uh, in the second example, oh, nice. Right, in the second ex example, I'm uh, querying just a single license uh, using the argument. So here, uh, I just want to get a MIT license. And what you might notice that uh, uh, since I'm querying license, I get license key in the response. But there's nowhere a mention of the argument I passed in. So for example, if I would like to fetch uh, two licenses from the server, let's say it's GPL 2.0. Now I would have a problem that uh, I would get two uh, like du duplicate keys. So what I can do, uh, I can just uh, rename the response on the client and write fill license doesn't exist under query type. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, this is what I get. So it's more flexible. The server, it doesn't care what I need. It doesn't care uh, how the data I'm going to consume. Uh, it just gives me the data that I ask him, and I can do whatever, whatever I want. Now, let's switch back to this mode. Right. Right. Now, you may notice that we are not working with URL at all, right? Compared to REST, where each endpoint has its own URL, in GraphQL, there is just one uh, endpoint. And this endpoint receives a query, parses it, executes it, and returns a response. Now, I want you to hold the breath for a few seconds, because it sounds terrifying when you hear it for the first time, 
But in GraphQL, all queries are sent as a payload of a POST request, even the read only once. It feels kind of wrong, something like HTML in JavaScript, which React introduced in uh, GA6. It, uh, it centrally breaks any network caching, and you need to rely on an uh, application cache. We'll talk about it later. But for now, just take it for granted. If you are using GraphQL, you have just one endpoint accept, accepting POST requests, and you send a query in a payload. Get the request are handled usually in development only, and uh, you can uh, access the, the nice interface that you saw before for uh, debugging. Now, it wouldn't be any useful to have, uh, uh, if you could only uh, query data uh, on a server, we also need a write operation to mutate the state. In GraphQL, this operation is called, as you might suggest, mutation. In REST, mutations are represented by patch, post, uh, put, post, and delete requests. Uh, much like in REST, mutations are usually write and read operations. Uh, you, you send some data to the server, and it gives you back the response, which is usually the newly created object or the updated object or uh, result of the, of the action. From a GraphQL point of view, the only difference between queries and mutation is the operation type at the beginning and uh, a different namespace. But otherwise, the syntax is completely the same. We pass uh, parameters we would like to send to the server as uh, arguments of the mutation. And the return value we define as a query. Uh, there is uh, no difference among mutations which create, update, or delete data. So it's convenient to name them, uh, name them after the effects they have, like, for example, create article or delete user. Uh, this is, again, a bit uh, problematic from REST, because in REST we have endpoint. And if we have some operations which are related to objects in this endpoint, we have like uh, this namespa namespace, and we can uh, these operations just uh, put under the namespace of this endpoint. But in uh, GraphQL, we have like just one namespace for all mutations. And it's completely up to us how we uh, organize uh, our schema. So uh, for example, you might include the name uh, of the object you are working with, and then uh, the name of operation. But it's completely optional. It's up to you. Now, it, it, it's great to have a query language where we can ask for data we actually need. In practice, however, we usually request the same shape of data uh, most of the time over and over. For example, when we create an object and get the response from the server, and later when we request the detail of the object, we would like to receive the same data. Now, to keep our uh, queries dry, uh, GraphQL introduces uh, fragments. Oh, I already had it there. No, I'm missing one slide. <laughs> anyway. Uh, GraphQL introduces fragments, and we can define what fields we would like to return uh, in a fragment, and then just return it. Uh, I accidentally missing one slide, so here is an example uh, where we have an endpoint which returns more than one object, and since we need to pass explicitly what data we would like to retrieve from the object, we need some way uh, to tell the query what uh, field we would like to retrieve from each object. And this is where the fragments uh, comes in, that uh, we can just uh, list fields we would like to retrieve from each object. Now, finally, the last operation in GraphQL uh, is subscription. Subscriptions are much like queries, but they are just sent over WebSockets <laughs> instead of HTTP. Uh, if you ever work with WebSockets, you are probably uh, serializing your objects anyway using your uh, REST serializers. So this works uh, a bit same. Uh, if you want to use a subscription, first you need to open a WebSocket connection. Then you send the sub subscription query to the server. And when a, a new object or updated object uh, ap appears on the server, it's sent back to the client. Uh, Again, from GraphQL point of view, the syntax is completely the same as for queries and mutations. 
what's really convenient that uh, once you are inside a client, you don't care if you are querying for uh, just w once for uh, one object or if you are subscribing for updates. Uh, the implementation of the transport layer is hidden in the client and you are just passing the GraphQL queries. Uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, since GraphQL is relatively new in the uh, Python community, the subscriptions are one of few things uh, that still needs to be figured out. Uh, they are supported in uh, core GraphQL libraries like uh, Graphene, but uh, implementation in common frameworks are missing. I just uh, managed to implement them in uh, Django using channels uh, only a few weeks ago, and I saw other developers are working in, uh, in uh, Flask integration, but so far there is no recommended implementation. And that's, uh, that's all for the basic uh, operations in GraphQL. And then now uh, let's go a bit deeper and take a look at field types. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that the server defines API as a schema. And GraphQL is a strongly typed language and schema describes what we can do with our data. So the most common component in GraphQL schema is an object. It represents uh, the object we can fetch from the server and what field it has. Uh, these types are uh, types which resolve to concrete values are scalars. In this example, it's uh, ID, string, but it can be float, integer, and boolean. And we can also specify that uh, some uh, uh, that field is non-nullable, and so it always has a value. And the the root uh, object type uh, is called the query type, and basically. Uh, it's, it's like a list of endpoints in REST API. It gives us the top level uh, queries, uh, which we can call to get the objects. What's more interesting, that we can actually define our custom types. Since data are usually exchanged uh, using JSON format, which supports only like numbers, string, boolean, and null, I think. Uh, sometimes we need to pass uh, over JSON uh, some other data types. And uh, GraphQL allows us to define uh, custom scalars, for example, here, uh, daytime. And then both client and server define their, their own uh, serializers and the serializers for these values. So for example, uh, I hope it's large enough. Uh, in this example, this is just some uh, uh, implementation of uh, date type in, uh, in Graphene. Uh, so we, we see that first we need to write a method which takes a string, returns a native data type, and the other way around, take a native data type and gives us a string. So we can actually uh, overcome the problem of JSON that it doesn't have uh, like more than four or five data types. Uh, the other uh, thing uh, what you can do with schema is validation. And uh, this is extremely useful because when you write a query, you know at the build time if uh, there is some uh, mistake or not before we actually run it and send the query to the server. You can also uh, refuse, for example, a mutation with invalid data because you know if the data has the right type or not. Uh, there are tools for REST APIs like API or Swagger which provide uh, like similar kind of validation. But uh, schema in GraphQL, however, is a first class citizen and not an op optional feature. So it's, uh, once you write a server, you already have the schema and this just works out of the box. And also it allows us uh, to introspect our, our schema. Uh, this is very useful, we know it from Python. Uh, and we can actually query our schema to get additional data about the data types we have. So uh, in this example, uh, using underscore type and passing the name of the type, you can get additional information. And this is uh, extremely useful, for, for example, if you have an uh, enum type and you would like to uh, show HTML select with uh, all possible values, you can just query the schema, what, what values are possible for uh, this data type and show it in uh, HTML select. Now, the final uh, part, which uh, 
we can write using the schema uh, is application cache. Uh, once you start fetching uh, nested data in a client, sooner or later you will start normalizing them. Instead of storing them like a nested data structure, you will store them by, uh, in a flat uh, data structure by object type. Because it just, it, it's much easier to work uh, with uh, data stored like that later on when you are updating them or uh, deleting them and so on. It's just easier to have it in cache uh, by object type and then glue them back together when you are rendering them. Now, since we have all the information in schema, uh, what the data type has uh, like uh, relations, we can build a generic application level cache. And we can also go one step further. And once we have a cache, we can first, uh, when we have a query, we can query the cache and see if we can get all the data we need from the cache. And if not, only then we send a net for request uh, to the server. And once we get the response, we cache it again. Now, it, it might feel like a poor substitute for a network cache. But on the other hand, we are making a maximal use of data uh, received from the server. And we are limiting the number of requests uh, sent uh, to the server even further. Now, again, think about mobile clients or slow network connections and making your client as responsive as possible even under these conditions. Now, finally, uh, since we have very fine control uh, over the data, uh, we can make our API more flexible. Adding a new field is uh, quite easy, both in REST and GraphQL. It, it doesn't make any harm if you are start receiving uh, another value in REST. But in GraphQL, you will always receive the same response because you explicitly say what uh, fields you want to get from the server. On the other hand, when you are removing a field or when you would like to remove a field, it's, it's not that easy. But in GraphQL, you can mark your field as deprecated with some reason and add a new field, uh, which is a new version, and like evolve your API in this backward compatible process. Uh, Lee Byron from Facebook said that uh, we still support three years of released Facebook applications on the same version of our GraphQL API. Uh, this is from the article three years ago, so uh, they probably support it uh, more years now, but uh, it actually makes your API evolve uh, more flexibly. <laughs> now, uh, I, I, I show you the, that the, the fourth version of GitHub API uh, uses GraphQL, uh, Facebook, obviously, because they develop it. But uh, also, many uh, large companies are moving to uh, GraphQL. GitHub, for example, states that uh, GraphQL offers uh, significantly more flexibility uh, for our integrators. And for my personal experience, the, the server side of GraphQL is about as uh, complex as when I was using Django REST framework. Just instead of serializes, I have object types. And instead of views, I have queries and mutations. But on the client side, it's, it's such a bliss. I just, when I replaced uh, uh, like homemade application cache, handling all REST responses with GraphQL, the code base just shrank to half. And that was at the beginning of the project before I started implementing some advanced UX improvements like optimistic updates or push notifications. And even though it's a strongly typed language, it just feels uh, much easier to use than, uh, than REST. So uh, that's all what I would like to say. Now, I'm just curious, uh, what's your opinion? So let me do a, a quick final survey again. So how many of you would like to implement your next API in GraphQL? Oh, that's, that's like about the same, like how many <laughs> know GraphQL, but OK. And how many of you, this is important, how many of you would never, ever like to use GraphQL? Don't be shy. I, I really, I'm actually, I'm sold to GraphQL. I, really, I, I would uh, trade my kidney, you know, to GraphQL. <laughs> but uh, I'm looking at this point for people who have like counter arguments. So if you have any, just, you know, tell me. Otherwise, thank you for your attention and uh, have a good day.
Okay, so we are running out of time, but we'll uh, at least try to answer two questions. So first one is, with GraphQL, you can construct really insane queries and effectively DDoS your backend. How do you prevent complex queries like this? Uh, the server knows the full query, and it can some, uh, like, if you know that the query is too deep, you can just limit the query and uh, return the error that this query is too deep. The, the server knows the full query, and it can react on it. So uh, I just read an article that you can, for example, uh, limit your responses that they can't be, uh, your queries that they can't be like more than two levels deep. But you have full control over the query. Like you can limit it as you want. OK, thank you. Next question. Is there any Python library that helps with defining granular permissions? Who can access what data objects, public, private attributes, read, write operations? Uh, permissions, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't know about any. And uh, since I'm using Graphene uh, as a backend, and I'm using like field level permissions, I just wrote it myself. It, I'm just at the beginning of a project, so it wasn't that hard, but no, I don't know about any yet. There is definitely a lot of room for uh, improvement in the uh, Python libraries for GraphQL. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, time is up, uh, and now it's a short five minutes break, and we will continue with next talk. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you.